I want to welcome you online one more time this morning. Thank you for joining us, and I hope that you are excited to spend this time together in God's Word. Uh, we're continuing a series today entitled Blessed. Everybody say blessed. And I just want to begin by saying thank you to Isaiah Rodriguez uh, for an amazing message last week. Um, but we have been studying the Beatitudes of Jesus, and the Beatitudes are eight blessings that Jesus put forward at the beginning of his ministry on what it means to be a citizen of God's kingdom. See, people were expecting the Messiah. They were expecting the Savior to come down and overthrow the Roman Empire. But Jesus came to establish the kingdom of God on earth. And these eight beatitudes or these eight blessings are so opposite from what the world thinks it means to be blessed. In fact, the word Jesus uses for blessed comes from the Greek word makarios. Makarios, which is a joy that is completely untouchable and independent of all the chances and changes of life. And I don't know about you, but in a confused culture, I want a joy that is not dictated by the circumstances in or around me. Can I get an amen? So come on, are you ready for the Word of God today? Let's get into it. We're going to read Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. And it says here, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who persecute, or, or, who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Come on, that's some good stuff right there. And so I want to take the next few minutes today and speak on the subject, it's a test. It's a test. And I want to begin with a word of prayer. So would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father in heaven, thank you so much that we get to be in your presence. We pray that our hearts would be open to your word, that your Holy Spirit would change us from the inside out, and that we can walk in the life that you want us to live, that you have called for us to live today. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to begin really quick with a, a question, and uh, just to kind of get everything moving this morning. And, and, and here's the question. How many of you would say you enjoy taking tests? Okay, just a raise of hands. How, I know I can't see you, but how many of you enjoy taking tests. You like taking tests. Okay. How many of you, on the other hand, you hate taking tests? You hate testing. Yeah, me too. I don't like tests. I don't like big tests. I don't like little tests. But one thing I noticed is that every one of us who raised our hand and said, I do not like taking tests. If I were to ask you another question, if I were to say, how many of you like using things that are tested? You would answer in the positive. You would answer that question by saying, yeah, of course, I like things that are tested, right? And so we don't like taking tests, but we like what is tested. I'll prove it to you. How many of you are glad that uh, the brakes on your car were tested before you purchased your vehicle? 
Yeah, I want them to be tested. How many of you are, are, are glad that the other drivers on the road were tested before they got their license? And, and how many of you think there needs to be a little bit more extensive testing for the other people who share the road with you? Come on, a little bit more strenuous testing in some areas would be great because I want the other drivers on the road to be tested. You know, when I board a plane, I'm glad the pilot didn't just get to feel led by the Spirit to fly my plane. I'm glad the equipment, right? I'm glad that there was a certification process and I'm glad that the equipment on the plane that I flew on was tested. You know, I used to get frustrated when there was a delay at the gate, you know, when you have to wait in your plane before you can take off. But when I realized that when they're doing, what they're doing is making sure that the thing is going to stay up in the air, I don't really mind it quite as much because I want to know that my plane was tested. You see what I'm saying? You don't want to go to a dentist who didn't have to get tested, a dentist who just, you know, generally wants to help people. But I want to know that you were tested before you put sharp metal objects in my mouth. I don't like taking tests, but I like what is tested. Because listen, I understand that what is tested can be trusted. That what is tested can be trusted. And what has not been tested cannot be trusted. You see, the more I study Jesus, the more I am convinced that he wasn't just teaching people a plan for leaving earth after death, but he was teaching people a way of life for while they are here. And I believe a lot of people are trusting Jesus for the life after this, but they haven't necessarily learned to trust him for the day-to-day life that they are living right now. Is Jesus relevant to my life, not just my death? I don't think the real test is what are you going to say to God when you die? The real test is will I follow Jesus as I live? That is the real test. Not just the moment that I stand before God, but everyday life, how I handle my money, how I speak to my wife, how I raise my children, how I behave when no one is watching. And the good news is the most amazing teacher is here today. And I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about the one we represent. You know, when Jesus preached his first sermon, when he shared what we are studying, which, is, which are the, the Beatitudes, he said, he said this in verse 5, and, and this is what we're going to be focusing on today, verses 5 and 6, but in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, he says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. You know, meek by definition is bridled strength, strength under control, freedom from resentment, submission. In fact, when you think about the word meek, I want you to think about a bit in the mouth of a horse, okay? This massive animal, but he is controlled by this little bit in his mouth. And that is how we are. We are full of strength. We are full of power. But when we choose submission, what we are deciding is that we are yielding our authority over to God. What we are deciding is that we are choosing to humble and submit ourselves to one another. I have the ability to do what I want, but by being meek, I submit myself to what God wants. And so Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And then he takes it even further. He says in verse 6, he says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. What if the reason so many people and even disciples 
are empty and unsatisfied is because their hunger and their thirst is not for righteousness, but for their own preference. Jesus is talking about a hunger that is so real and so intense and so spiritual that it will never be completely satisfied until we see Jesus again. And here is the connection between these two Beatitudes in verses 5 and 6. We not only submit to the will of God, we hunger and we thirst for the will of God. Isn't that good? Come on. We not only submit to the will of God, which is being meek. No, we hunger and we thirst and we long and we desire for the will of God. And I want to show you how Jesus perfectly represents the connection between meek and and hunger and thirst for righteousness. Let me show you in in Matthew chapter 4. Jesus has been baptized by John the Baptist and immediately, immediately, everybody say immediately, immediately, After he was baptized, the scripture says Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested. How how would you like that, right? You just are baptized. You're not even fully dried from the waters of your baptism. And, And the Spirit of God leads you into a test. And this is what happens to Jesus. He, it says that he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, it says he was hungry. I love when the Bible is just blatantly obvious, right? And it says afterwards, he was hungry. I bet he was, right? That's got to be the most obvious scripture in the whole Bible, don't you think? But verse 3 says, the tempter came to him at this, at the most opportune time when Jesus found himself in a weakened place. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And so Satan tries to get the son of God to fulfill a God-given hunger in an ungodly way. He tries to get Jesus to turn these stones into bread. He tries to get Jesus to break the fast and to fulfill his hunger the wrong way. But Jesus answered in verse 4, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. In other words, Jesus says, I've got something that is way more important than what I want in this moment. And maybe the reason that God said Jesus was hungry is so we would not think that he was so superhuman and supernatural because he was fully God, but he was also fully man. And he doesn't want us to mistake the meaning of this test. Jesus really was hungry and he really could have done something about his hunger. And sometimes you really do get lonely. And sometimes you get so lonely that you will compromise the calling God has for you just so you do not have to feel lonely anymore. Even if it means doing things other than the way God designed it. Because you know what? When it comes down to it, I hate to admit it, but the truth is, I want what makes me feel good. And so often in my life, I am weakened in my faith, not because of some complicated thing that I don't understand, but because I just do not want to do what God has told me to do. 
We know something is wrong. We know something is harmful. We know it would not honor God. But right now it feels so good. So we will go to the world to turn stones into bread. And when we wake up the next day hungry again, we wonder what went wrong. But the truth is, I loved myself more than I loved the Word of God. And sometimes, let's just admit it, the devil didn't even make you do anything. It's just your own desires. See, sin happens when you try to meet a God-given desire outside of God's intended design. And anybody who tells you sin isn't fun hasn't ever done it right. Because to be crucified with Christ means sometimes you have to take what you think you want and nail it to the cross and bow down before what God knows you really need. But it's impossible to be filled with the desires of God while also pursuing my own selfish desires. And so the things we know we are supposed that that we are supposed to do don't match up with what we believe. And honestly, sometimes we just don't care because I can be very selfish. And yet Jesus will not turn the stones into bread. Because he desires and he hungers and he thirsts for God's will more than he wants his own will. In fact, the scripture that Jesus uh, uses and the scripture that he quotes to Satan comes from Deuteronomy chapter 8. And it says in Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 1, I want to read it to you. This is what Moses is saying to God's people. He says, be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart whether or not you would keep his commands, he humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Why did God lead his people through the wilderness for 40 years? Well, it says he did this to humble them and to test them so that he can know what was in their heart. And in the same way, Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days and God allowed his people to hunger so that he could teach them that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And so much of what I have been going through lately, uh, man, it just resonates with so much with what this passage is saying, but also what Jesus shares in in Matthew chapter 4, and also what we're looking at in the Beatitudes today. Because with so many things that that I've been going through, different fears, different worries, different anxieties, what's going on in my health? Is there something bigger going on? Am Am I worrying for nothing? Am I anxious for nothing? And I've got all these worries and all these concerns and all these anxieties. And I feel like what what God is doing is, Mike, are you willing to wait on every word? that comes from my mouth? Are you willing, are you willing to be patient? Because see, testing reveals what we really want. It reveals what we really desire. 
And so are we willing to wait on every word that comes from the mouth of the uh, mouth of God or will we take things into our own hands? Come on somebody. Jesus passed the test. And so Satan comes at him from another angle. In Matthew chapter 4 verse 5. It says then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. Now you can be assured that there were big crowds gathered at the temple that day. And so now he tries to get Jesus to prove something to all the people standing around at the temple. He tries to appeal to his pride. Look at what he says in verse 6. Satan says, If you are the Son of God, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Pause. Did you hear what what we just read? Satan is quoting Scripture to Jesus. Not only is that messed up, but it also lets us know the trick and the scheme of the enemy because it is the attack of the enemy to try and get you to adjust the Word of God to fit your life instead of adjusting your life around the Word of God. Come on, did you hear what I just said? The enemy wants to convince you that you need to adjust the Word of God to fit your life instead of adjusting your life around the Word of God. Satan tells Jesus to throw himself down Because you can get a lot of people to like you and follow you if you would just do something spectacular. But Jesus didn't live for the approval of people. He had nothing to prove. That is why he was holy. Because he did not live to prove himself to others. He lived to please the one who sent him. The one he came from. The one that he belonged to. And so Jesus responds in verse 7. He answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. I think it is impossible to really pursue God if your life is all about how others see you. Because how can you be made into the image of Christ if you are so obsessed with what everybody around you thinks about you? How can we really become who God says we really are if we are spending all this time pretending to be something we are not? How can we have a good conversation seasoned with salt if every word I speak is trying to get you to think I'm interesting, but the scriptures tell us speak only what is helpful for building others up? Instead of trying to impress others, Put the focus on building up others and then you can live out your calling. Can I get an amen? You know, I I read about this story recently. There was this dad and his daughter kept dressing immodestly and being disrespectful toward her parents. And so they were going to go out and eat and uh, I'm about to scar you because this dad, he he got tired of of his daughter putting on all this immodest clothing. He was trying to explain to her, come on, you don't have to dress a certain way for guys to like you because they won't really want you. They will only want what you can give them. But she wasn't having it. And so this family is going out to eat dinner and his dad gets an idea. And so he comes, he, he, he comes out and he gets some old jeans and he alters these old jeans. He basically cuts them into these short shorts to get them to look like the kind of clothes that his daughters wear, that his daughter wears. And uh, you're totally going to see the picture. Check it out. And he said that they went to the restaurant. People were taking pictures. He said that they went to play mini golf. And he said, at the end of the evening, there was no, Dad, I get it. Dad, you are the best. Thanks for that awesome lesson. But he said, my daughter will always know that her dad loves her 
and cares for her enough to make a fool out of himself. Now, you may not agree with his parenting strategy, but the statement he was making was a powerful one. Because he was saying, I have a daughter and she is throwing herself at the world and she is valuable and she does not know what she's really doing. And so I'm going to show her because I care more about her than I care about what she thinks of me or what anybody else thinks about me. I got a daughter that I love. See, love will make you do crazy things. Love will make you do things you wouldn't normally do. Love will make you walk away from a conversation and say, sorry, I cannot be a part of this. This just isn't good for me. Oh, well, she thinks she's too good. She thinks he, she, she's somebody. No, I don't think I'm somebody. I'm just in love with somebody. I just got a relationship that is so much greater than this superficial stuff that you are obsessed with. And so excuse me if I'm devoted to the one who died for me. Excuse me if I am devoted to the one who saved me and called me. And you cannot do either. And so here is my life, Lord. I not only submit to your will, I hunger and thirst for your will. And that is the statement we are trying to make. But when you are so focused on impressing people, you have no focus left over to give to pleasing to God. No wonder it is so hard to live the way Jesus wants me to live because we have nothing left to give him after living for everybody else all day long, right? I mean, and this should change. This should change how we live our lives. This should change how we spend our money. I'm not spending my money to try to keep up with other people or try to keep up this image of, of how people see me. No, this is, this is going to change how I parent my kids. I'm not trying to parent my kids so that they act good in front of other people so I look like a good parent. No, I'm going to parent my kids the way that God wants me to parent my kids. I mean, come on. It's nice to be liked, but if you liking me causes me to compromise my love for God, then you are not worth it. I don't need you to like me that bad because I am so thankful that Jesus stood with me and there is no amount of loneliness in this world that is going to make me compromise my closeness with him for you. I'm just not going to do it. Jesus said, I'm not going to do that. I don't need to prove anything. And so the final temptation of Jesus goes like this. Okay, I can't get you to turn stones into bread because Jesus was not motivated by what he wanted right now. He was motivated by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So, okay, that didn't work. Throw yourself down off the temple. But that's not going to work either. Why? Because Jesus had nothing to prove. He was the son of God. But, but this third one, this third temptation is interesting because it teaches us about the way Satan wants us to see God. In verse 8, it says again, The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said if you will bow down and worship me. Satan is essentially trying to get Jesus to take a shortcut around the cross. See, Jesus came to establish the kingdom of God on earth. And he came to win all the kingdoms of the world and their glory back from Satan. And in this moment, Satan is trying to offer all of these kingdoms to Jesus if he will only bow down and worship him. Listen closely. This changed my life. You know, Satan says, all this I will give you if you bow down and worship. But our God says, 
All this I have given you. Now bow down and worship. Do you see the difference? The world says, I will give you my love if you bow down and worship me. But God says, I have given you my love. Now bow down and worship me. You have not been chosen because of anything you have done, but because of what he accomplished when he shed his blood on the cross and he freed you by breaking the chains of sin that were holding you down. And so Jesus said to him, he said, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. And as we get ready to take communion this morning, this question kind of comes to my mind. You know, what gave Jesus the strength to take a stand and not give in? And I can't help but wonder if it is what happened right before he went out into the wilderness. Would you like to know what happened right before he went out into the wilderness? Well, he went down to the Jordan River and John the Baptist was doing his thing. And it says, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is, listen to these words, it is proper for us to do this to fulfill all what? Righteousness. Jesus' hunger and his thirst was not for his own will. Not only was he willing to submit to the plan and the will of God, but he was hungering and thirsting to do righteousness, to do the will of God. And it goes on to say, then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. You know what the secret to becoming more like Christ is? Do you know how Jesus was, was able to stand that test? It's not by trying to get God to like you more through your behavior. It's becoming more aware of how much love God already, already has for you. What does God say to Jesus in this moment? He says, this is my son. This is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Jesus had not even started his ministry yet. Jesus had not done anything yet. He hadn't even healed anybody yet. And God is saying, that's not why I'm pleased with you. I'm pleased with you because you are my son and I love you. You are loved. And in the same way, right? It's not me trying to get God. It's not you trying to get God to like you more through your behavior. But just like Jesus, it's you becoming more aware of how much love God already has for you. It is your identity. And if I am in Christ and God is pleased with his son, then maybe he is pleased with me too. And now when I wake up every day, I don't have to refresh the screen to find out who likes me and who doesn't because I'm not trying to get you to like me. I'm trying to be more like Christ because I am becoming more and more aware of how much God already loves me. And so I bow down because he has already given me his love. And so now when you get to work and now when you go to go to school on Monday and you're tempted and tested to live selfishly or to live for the approval of others or to try to earn God's love, here are some questions you can ask. You know, 
Am I doing this for me or for God? Is my hunger and my desire for what I want or for what God wants? Is my hunger and my desire to please others or please God? Am I doing this because I believe if I can just be better, then God will love me more? And if you can make it through those questions, then you can finally say, I'm not doing this, but for any other reason than to be more like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. And this is how you stand through the test and live out the life that God has for you. And I hope that encourages you today as you take communion, that you are loved. But it's, but it's, it's, it's looking at my heart and, and seeing, am I living out of that place of love or am I trying to earn and, 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 and yeah, earn the love and that approval from others? Or am I trying to get that from God? And I know that none of us are perfect, and I know none of us can f- fully do that. There's no way we can do that perfectly. But in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, it says, Since we have a great high priest who ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tested and tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. So let us this morning, as we take communion, approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. God, we thank you for these two beatitudes, blessed are the meek and blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. God, we do not want to be people who just submit to your will, although that is amazing, but we want to be people who take it to the next level. We want to be people who hunger and thirst for your will. We want to be people who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And so as we take communion today, God, help us to reprioritize and recalibrate our desires and help us to to long and hunger and thirst for what you want more than what we want. And thank you for Jesus who did what we could never do, who passed the test that we could never pass so that we can come before you in this moment and find mercy and find encouragement and find confidence, not because of what we have done, but because of what he has done. And so God, we thank you. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.